Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. From the Gotham Podcast Studio, Ain't Hard to Tell Podcast, episode 110. 110. Yeah. Remember when I used to yell at the beginning of the podcast? You they never thought we'd make it this far. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Now you don't They never thought we'd make it I, here. I, I'm glad you finished that sentence because he's like, remember when I used to yell? I'm like, you still do. <laughs> like, you still yell all the time. Oh. Uh, episode 110. This is why you got to let people finish their sentences. 110. Uh, so 110. Thanks to Henry. Brian Fonseca here. All Star Weekend just got done, but we we really don't have to break that down. Break that down. All Star Weekend <laughs> got done. Hope you enjoyed the All Star Weekend. Shout out to our peoples who were out in Chicago. Yeah, uh, doing some coverage. Our peoples at the Seven Footers Podcast. Yeah. Um, also, Eric, Murph was out Mur- there. Murph was out there. Erica yeah. Fernandez. Erica, she, she's was she out there? Was she out there? No, no, she no. Just, she wasn't she was out a, there. You know, she was posting so much on Twitter. I thought she was out there. So Erica, Rob I'm Lopez bothered. was out there. Rob Lopez Rob out Lopez. there. So some friends of the podcast were out there freezing their behinds off. In Chicago. Yeah, no, um, not for me. You know, it's funny. I, I previously came from somewhere. I was freezing my behind off before that in Chicago when I spoke to Gerard about that. I was up in western New York uh, covering this crazy cold front that came through and how it was going to affect wine up there. I did get some good wine out of it. How is it going to affect wine up there? That's where your mind went? No, that's what my story was about. Oh, I, I didn't doing. see this. Yeah. This was on the timeline? Yeah, oh, yeah, I got to yeah. I gotta yeah. check this out. I went and talked to some people <laughs> at some of the vineyards. I wasn't making that up just because I was wanting to talk about wine. No, usually <laughs> these come across my radar and I watch them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Somebody else saw it and they were like, oh, man, that was actually really informative. They didn't They didn't think of, think about it in that way. But no. I know a couple people I got to send that to. I know some wine connoisseurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, it's, you don't want, like, the, I learned a lot about it, about how the cold, if it sits too long, can affect the crop, anything. But, yeah, as much as I love wine, we're not going to talk about that. Um, also, a weekend done, a lot going on in the world of sports. Um, we're going to kick it off. We don't normally do this uh, with some baseball. Uh, we t- but what does it say about when the, the times we do kick it off with baseball? It has to be scandalous. Other than when we have Nick Pollock up here. Yeah. It's got, <laughs> it's, it's got to be scandalous. You know, Nick Pollock or Marley Rivera is coming to coming to talk about it. It's got to be scandalous. And, uh, oh, word. Marley got to come back. Yeah. Shout out to Marley. I was just texting with her the other day, and she's now starting her uh, spring training coverage as pitchers and catchers have reported. And um, a lot came out this week because, obviously, Baseball had the big scandal through the offseason with the Astros and the sign stealing cheating. We covered this on a previous episode. Um, but now, and this is something I was actually interested in. So now the players, the management, everybody had to face the music. And I'm doing air quotes air so people quotes, can't yes. see. That's important. Face the music because I'm not really sure they face the music how they should. Yeah. But so, no information nonetheless. Is there really new information? Yeah, that's, that's a fair question. I is, it, is it really new? Did they really New give developments, us- I guess. Which is? Am I missing this new development? Fair enough. Go ahead. No, what's the new? What? No, what did you think was a new development? No, I mean just the fact that it came back up in the news. Oh, oh, okay. No, that's not new developments. This came back up in the news. What well, came back up in the news? Maybe the, we're bored. I don't know. Now, now the players actually could be questions, and microphones are in front of them at spring training, and and they're talking about it. And he, so a lot of things. So the Astro players came out, and they were very apologetic. Okay. Oh, we're sorry. The Astros owner came out and said, ridiculously, and I'm going to say this is absolutely ridiculous, he said it didn't affect anything. Their cheating didn't affect anything. Yeah. It's one thing to cheat, man, and it's bad, and it's not right, and it hurts the game and all this other stuff. To then come out there and be so arrogant to say that it didn't affect anything. To double down. That's like me punching you in the face and then saying, and one of your teeth gets knocked out, and now you're speaking different and be like, nah, you you good. Or saying you did it by accident, which I did do to somebody when I was in middle school. But I was in middle school. We don't have to get into that today. 
We'll get into that. I have so many questions. <laughs> I always have questions about your youth. I have a lot of questions. I got suspended about from school a couple times. You know, we what I'm we, saying, we, so. we need a whole podcast on youth. Better yet, <laughs> what we really need is the same thing's going to happen to me. One day we're going to have some friend or somebody up here, and I'm going to get to ask some questions about your youth. I got to think about who would be suitable for that. <laughs> oh man! Oh, to answer the questions appropriately to lie for you because because there there are different eras of my existence. Violence. <laughs> there are different eras of my existence. There's me growing up. In school, and there's me growing up outside of school, and then there's also in college. The college person, I already know who I'd bring on. He would be perfect. Okay. But other than that, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so the Astros, you know, they said they say this stuff. I want it, Before I get into some of the comments that other players have had to say, which I think is fan- fascinatingly interesting, I would like to shout somebody out. I'd actually shout, shout out a media outlet. I would love to shout them out. Hmm. Let's give a shout out to KTLA. In Los mm, Angeles. Yeah, they, they've been. They've Shout been, out to you, KTLA. If been you upset. missed this, if people didn't see this, KTLA, state TV station out in LA, I believe that is the CBS affiliate, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were showing the Astros press conference that they had when they were speaking about this. And they had a picture of Jose Altuve, you know, up on the screen where Jose Altuve mm-hmm. was speaking. And I want to make sure I get this correctly. Yeah. Um, they had, as for people who were not in the business, do not know, a, a lower third graphic or a Chiron, as it is called in the TV business. Instead of putting Jose Altuve in an Astros second baseman, they called Jose Altuve appropriately what he was. Astros cheater. Astros cheater. I wish Jose Altuve wasn't Hispanic, man. Yo, man. I'm not you know saying you got to claim like, him. Sometimes it be your own people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes they be cheating. <laughs> like, oh. like, like like they put it they gave no dams and just put cheating. Astros cheater. You know Lebatar's show does that all the time with stuff. I love it. Where it's just like a, it's just a gag. You know what I'm saying? But like to see a TV station do it is another thing. However, they're not the first TV station that done this. Mm. TV station in Pittsburgh, who I used to intern for. Back in the day, wow. when I was in Pittsburgh, KDKA. Wow. Remember after the, uh, uh, what Super Bowl was this? I believe Super Bowl 50, 53? There were no Super Bowls? Uh, it was before Super Bowl 53. They put up Tom Brady was speaking, and they put known cheater. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you like, know, people when people want to say like, oh, you know, the excellence. Of, I don't want to turn this into the Patriots podcast or whatever, but you know. Well, I mean, when, when, is, when is, this goes down to the point I think we made the last time we spoke about this, when there is no punishment, these are the things that can happen. And I don't necessarily have a problem with the people who are calling them cheaters because that's what they did. The Astros then how they've handled this and come out in this is kind of it seemed to me like let's get it, let's get let's say that we've cheated that we're sorry and we just want this to move on the thing i think about this with baseball this is something this doesn't need to move on quickly this needs to stay here this people need to remember this people need to call them out for their cheating i'm a huge proponent that the title should be vacated they shouldn't hang it up in their arena nobody should go there and be proud of it yeah and if you're proud of it that says a lot about you as a person yeah you probably also like the electoral college process too. Oh my god! But you're probably that kind of person. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> Sorry. Damn. Now, other players, Brian. Yes. Have have spoken about this. Cody Bellinger being one of them, and Cody Bellinger, who he spoke out about this, and I know you love this statement. He basically on the Astros cheating scandal, and this is per uh, Sports Center. I thought, quote, this is from Cody Bellinger. I thought Manfred's punishment was weak. These guys were cheating for three years, he says of the Astros. Jose Altuve stole an MVP from Aaron Judge in 2017. Everyone knows they stole the ring from us, close quote. He's right. And I tell you what, Whew, he's man. come at Man- Manfred and said that his punishment was weak. Didn't somebody else call him a clown? Somebody called Manfred a clown or, or a joke? Somebody yeah. called him a joke the other day? Yeah, yeah. Ah, damn, I don't remember who it was. And it made me think, like, yo, do you think there's an I mean, people have been mad at Roger Goodell. And have said stuff in the NFL, but you got this dude saying his punishment is weak. It was a joke. This is also after players were told they shouldn't be speaking on this. Kind of shows me the players don't really respect Manfred like that. Yeah, and Kurt Suzuki is someone else who spoke out uh, because he was asked about this. He was asked, do you think the Astros were cheating when you guys played them in the World Series? The Washington Nationals just won their most recent World Series. They played the Astros in that World Series. Yep. Um, 
The question was asked, do you think the Astros were still cheating in that World Series? He said, oh, yeah, no question. Suzuki responded. We could hear it from dugout. We could hear their whistling. Their whistling. What were you going to do? That's what he said per CBS Sports Vin, uh, via Thomas Boswell of the Washington Post. I mean, at the end of the day, I, know- I think all the players know. I mean, we talked about this before where pretty much all the players understand what was going on here. And now they're actually speaking out about it. It also leads me to believe, I mean, like, I don't think the Astros were alone in this, but that part of it still, at least for now, has yet to be proven. Whether they were the only team sign stealing, I guess they were the only one doing it in this sort of emphatic way, if that makes any sense. Right. But I I don't know, man. I just, this baseball season, I don't want to be talking about this all baseball season, but I also don't think that, Major League Baseball handled this probably the way that they should have. Now, conversely, Manchester City, totally coincidentally, uh, they just got banned from Champions League, which is a huge deal internationally. One second before, one second before we go um, that I want to mention because you talked about um, Cody Bellinger. Carlos Correa came back at him. Oh, no, I'm going to tie this in. Because, oh, okay, go ahead. Because they got banned from Champions League. Yep. They got fined 30 million euros for two years. And they got fined 30 million euros and they got banned for two years from Champions League. And what people are saying on social media is, hey, MLB, that's how you're supposed to handle a situation like this. Mm-hmm. Where what they did, probably not as egregious as what the Astros did, because they just lied about how much money they were getting ultimately, right? Yeah, because, because the they're, they're supposed to share the revenue among the Champions League teams that are involved in it. The Astros won a whole championship. And shifted an entire narrative about them being a bad organization and things like that and all of a sudden they became the sort of uh the standard for player development and how things are done the right way and they're the anti-yankees not buying championships and developing guys and carlos correa and altuve and all these bregman and all this you know hitting home runs and minute may park and it's the new hotbed of baseball and now all that stuff is flipped I think, upside I, down i think it's a great point with Manchester um, City, um, you know, co- co- coming in and comparing that what they did isn't necessarily – it didn't necessarily impact competition on the field. It did impact, obviously, revenue other c- clubs yeah. can get. And, and Champions League is like, yo, nah, dog. We're no, not – You're not, you're not going to have – an unfair advantage in the whole fair share thing. And I, I'm gonna, we're gonna I don't know th- if people in America understand it fully, too. Like, getting banned from Champions League for two years for a program like Manchester City is huge. Well, it's huge for a program like Man City, who, um, for people who don't watch Premier League soccer, who've kind of really come up. They have one of the best coaches in the world in Pep Guardiola. Mm-hmm. They have really come up in the last couple of years. They won the, the Premier League title. Uh, the previous year, they have never won Champions League in their history. My team, Liverpool, is most likely going to win the Premier League title this year. They won Champions League last year. They could repeat again this year. I would. I don't think it's as likely the way they've been playing people, but it's possible. <laughs> but, yeah, this is what happens. Just so people understand, we're going to play some sound. This is courtesy of ITV News. Uh, it will answer for you why Manchester City has been banned for Champions League for two years by UEFA. That's a governing body in Europe that overlooks Champions League. Take a listen. And we're going to tie this into the Astro stuff right up, right on the back end. Let me play this. I almost had a failure there, which is not good. Because I want to know how, what Carlos Correa said as a fellow Puerto Rican. I'm 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 ready to get disappointed. <laughs> I'm not I'm not hearing no I'm not hearing the audio right now. So we'll just we'll we'll move we'll move on with that. But. Um, Basically, it, it has to do with, as I said, the, the fair um, financial regulations and the money is supposed to be evenly, sort of like the NFL has their revenue sharing system, sort of the same way. And so what the UEFA is saying is no team is going to have a financial advantage over the other one. So you can't. what it appears, based on the reports, is that Manchester City lied or exaggerated how much their um, sponsorship revenue that they were getting, which could impact how much that they would get. Two things. One – Another example of other places doing things better than America does. And two, again, not as bad as what the Astros did. It's not. And the Astros got off way, way lighter. Way lighter. I mean, I do agree that there's something. Another American issue. If you're going to have a suspension and you're going to hold people accountable, you have to have, this is what I said to you before, B, you got to have a deterrent that is so heavy handed that people are not going to do it again. Because you know what? Not only they were they banned for two years, they was also fined thirty million euros. Yeah, this is one of the richest teams in the world, and they got slapped with a thirty million euro fine. Okay, that's 
no joke. 30 million euros to dollars is upwards of 32 million million dollars. Okay, for yeah. Budon. That's 32 million dollars. That is going to make an owner of a team think twice about doing this, whether you're Liverpool, whether you're, you know, Barcelona, whether you're any of these teams that that are playing, you know, in in Champions League that have big money teams with big money stars. You are not going to. Nobody wants to take a thirty-two million dollars. I'm trying to think what is the what is the MLB equivalent of this, right? So the Astros, imagine imagine a scenario where this will be they'll get banned for the playoffs for two years, they probably lose their championship, and they'd probably be fined fifty million dollars. The difference, the or difference, thirty-two million. I don't because fifty million in MLB is at thirty million in Champions League. The difference, the difference with this in the MLB is that in, with Champions League and for Man City. They still have something to play for. They're not banned from the Premier League. They from can still the play. League, they can yeah. still play for a Premier League title. But as most people know, but they didn't win a championship like the Astros say? did. They didn't win a championship like the Astros. Well, did. they won the Premier League championship last year. They won that title. Well, not the but, but yeah, the but not the Champions League. League. The yeah. reason you can't have that. This is a strict governing body. UEFA is over the entirety of Europe. Yeah. The reason Champions League matter is the best champ teams in every of the big leagues in Europe that play for this champion. It is the, one of the most coveted trophies in the world. Yeah. So clearly this is why they had to send a message. They're like, no, this is something that people watch worldwide. Yeah. People love these Champions League matchups. You're seeing the best of the best, the best, of the best. play against each other. Spain, it means something to win that. Teams in Spain, teams in England, teams in... So now Man City, just to put this in perspective, this is what we didn't get to hear for the, from the audio, they have a chance to... They can play in Champions League this year. They are playing. They're already playing this year. Yeah. They're going to compete. And see if they can advance past the round of sixteen, etc. Yeah, they won the Premier League title next year. The big st- they have a great coach, great players in there. Again, I said they're not going to win the Premier League title this year because Liverpool, my team, go Reds, are running away with it. This means a lot for this club because they've never won the Champions League before. Yeah. It brought so much joy to Liverpool when we won the Champions League last year to say that you're the best team in Europe. When they, if they, for them not to be able to do it the next two years, when they have one of the best coaches in the game in their prime, this is unprecedented. And by comparison, what do the Astros get? They lose their GM. I said, yeah, they lose their coach, right? And that's not much. That's they really got a five million dollar fine. Five million? I mean, and their championship still still holds. I five million is not that much. I wonder. Let's let's actually, th- you know, the way this fine went and everything that went down, the comparable thing would have been like, what if? What if Man City had won Champions League last year? Right. Would they get vacated? It? Would they if have? If you ask me, my gut. I think feeling, they would have. I think UEFA would have absolutely vacated it because they would have never said that they would have wanted this to affect them. They would have said it wasn't part of the fair play. You know what I mean? Like now, it really benefits them more financially than it does on the field. But financial benefits do 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 have an impact on the field. And everybody knows in soccer, you have transfer windows mm-hmm. and the ability to buy players. So if you're already one of the richest teams, and then you could buy more players or get more talent on your team in that way by get generating more revenue, that is unfair. And so it could affect on the field. It's not as direct as the Astros, but it can. I do think your point is fair that it's a slap on the wrist in this league. I think MLB wants to come out looking good here. And I don't see how you can defend this. Now, one of the things I was going to bring up is Carlos I Correa. saw Carlos Correa uh, came back um, he better not and said something. Me. He said, this is Correa. Bellinger says Jose Altuve cheated. Aaron Judge out of the MVP. Cody, you don't know the facts. This is what Correa told Ken Rosenthal of the Athletic, Athletic on Saturday. In rebutting Bellinger's criticism of Altuve, Correa claimed the second baseman didn't use the trash can to steal pitches from opponents. He cited Altuve, Josh Reddick, and Tony Kemp as the lone members of the 2017 who didn't partake in the illicit sign-stealing method, according to that. Uh, the few times that the trash can was banged was without Altuve's consent, and he would go inside the clubhouse and inside the dugout to whoever was banging the trash can. He would get pissed. He would get mad, Correa told Rosenthal. He would say, I don't want this. I can't hit like this. Don't you do that to me. He played the game clean. Uh, hold on. In 2019, this is from Correa about the buzzers. Nobody wore buzzers. That's a lie. So when he's running from third base to home plate, I'm the guy up front. The all-star added the first one waiting for him. He's like, don't take my shirt off. The second reason he doesn't want me to talk about this, but I'm going to say it, is because he's got an unfinished tattoo on his collarbone. That honestly looked terrible. It was a bad tattoo, and he didn't want anybody to see it. He didn't want to show it at all. So one, he didn't want to take his shirt off because his wife 
I told my wife earlier in the year for me not to do that, so he was telling me not to do it. And number two, he had an unfinished tattoo that looked kind of bad that he didn't want people to see and people to talk about. That was the reason. Uh, Altuve declined to address the media after that, of course. Um, blah, 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 blah. Your thoughts? All skin folk and kin folk. <laughs> True. And also, more importantly with this, and, 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 and Carlos, what, come on, son. Correa. What are, you, what are you doing? Correa. What are you doing? I've met Correa. Correa seems like a very nice dude. Talk to him. Ay, I don't know ay, him. Ay. But here's the thing, Correa. Here's the problem. He's going to make me curse in Spanish. Bro. We don't believe you. You <laughs> need more people. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash A-H-T-T. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Could the tattoo thing be true? Possibly. Dog, the, the splits are enough. The splits are enough. You're telling me that. <laughs> and here's the thing. The splits, so, the banging on the track. Like, we have enough evidence now. We've seen, we've practically seen the buzzer. So, Jose Altuve. We've seen how uh, Jose Altuve running to home plate saying, don't take off my shirt. He says because of a tattoo. Well, right. But before he said it was because, uh, I'm not doing this. Like, what, what are we doing? Jose Altuve is going to tell me he went to the dugout and he wants to play the game clean, but he never told anybody to stop. All of y'all, if all of you who were there, I don't care if you didn't listen, you tried to say you weren't for it, you let it go on. You didn't go up to upper management to your owner and tell him to stop it. You knew you were benefiting from it. You just were hoping you didn't get caught. So stop the nonsense. I'm still looking at Jose Altuve sideways just on the just on the basis of being a five foot six dude who hits about 30 home runs. In a season. I would also like to... Like, just period, full stop there. That's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, as a fellow short dude, who's not as strong as Jose people's. Altuve, but I'm like, dog. I mean, he's got 128 career home runs, but he was a... First of all, first of all, have you ever seen this uptick, right? So I know some dudes, like, you know, uh, they just hit the ball better as they progress or whatever the case may be. But his first full season, he had 576 at-bats. He had seven home runs. After that, he had 626 at-bats. He had five home runs. After that, he had 660 at-bats. He had seven home runs. Then all of a sudden, he has 638. He has 15, 640, 24, 590, 24, 534, 13. Got hurt that year. 531. That's not a little suspect. He's 5'6". I'm taller than him. It's not to me. It's to me the the splits that is suspect. I think all of it is suspect. I think everything is suspect. Couple. We're gonna get off this, but a couple things because this has annoyed God me. Damn it, man! Because I I, like I, I told you before, too. I think this is worse than steroids. I've told you that before. I have some. I have some ideas of what I would do about things here. First of all, fans. I think fans can make this issue not. This issue needs to stick around. People need to be asking about it. Reporters need to dig in. We need to find out. But fans, you can do your part this year. I think everybody in every major league stadium, they won't allow this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> everybody should be allowed to bring in a broomstick, yeah, and a trash can, yeah. Remember I said that when they, run, when they play. If I was, the, if I was, yo, if I was an A's fan, when the Astros come into Oakland, I'm bringing a trash can, I'm bringing a, a broom or a spoon or whatever. We just bang it, just the whole game, just the whole do, game. Do, do, just do, 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 do. I'm just doing it. Be like, how, yeah, let's see, let's see how that affects. And you. I'm trying to get seats that are near the dugout, which you know, some baseball stadiums is not that hard or not that safe now. Because I'm not that. <laughs> uh, secondly, baseball, could we get a full report on this? Clear and transparent, what's going on? Full report of what's going on. None of this cloak and dagger stuff. Let's let us know. And let me. There was a quote that I saw from Correa the other day that bothered me. Correa said, what we did in 17 was wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. When we first when we first started doing it, it almost felt like an advantage, but it was definitely wrong. Almost? Wait. How does almost? It, how does it almost feel like an advantage, but it's definitely wrong? You see what I'm saying? Like, it can't, what? It can't be both of those. What are you talking about? <laughs> it was definitely wrong, and we should have stopped at the time, but you didn't. Right? Like, but you didn't. 
this this is getting great. Also comes up. It's like it's like Dusty Baker's now come out and said he wants the Astros to be protected from people taking retaliation against his team. Now you know I'm not here for the throwing at people in baseball and all that. I'm not here for that at all whatsoever. I don't think players should throw at them or do anything. My brother's already said he's beaming them when he plays the show. <laughs> he's like he's he's like I'm getting one a game. One Astro game. However, in the culture of baseball where people are really mad about this, and I'm glad that people are mad about this, I do think you're going to see some people get being. Um, and this is Dusty Baker said, it's not good for the game. It's not good for the kids to see it. I think it's bu- It wasn't good for the kids to see cheating. Dusty Baker's in a tough spot. But he... That's why he got hired, because it's a tough spot. They could put the black man in that. Oh, That's a whole other God, thing. Man. Dusty Baker wasn't getting another chance. <laughs> Oh, and he's a stopgap manager. They're probably going to somebody, somebody else. asked somebody if they would consider uh, Dodgers right-handed Ross Stripling was asked if he would lean toward beating Astro players. He said, yeah, I would lean toward yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, these players are giving no damn. The, the- I, I, I just wish, I just wish, I just wish the Astros, particularly Correa and Altuve, were not Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Sorry, yo, your peoples was out there cheating, man. I know. It wasn't just them. You no, know what I'm saying? It Carl- wasn't just them. But like, Carlos Beltran. Baseball, you know like- base, <laughs> baseball needs to take account. This is only going to get worse. And I think the players, because of because I'm intrigued to see how people feel about baseball policing itself because people like to use that. Yeah. Like now, this year, when players want to police themselves, even though I do not advocate beating people, I really am not for that. But when it comes time and to place. that, I don't think it's cool. There's nothing cool about throwing. <laughs> no, I agree. But that time but, and place, and this would be the time and place. Yeah, but then that, but then watch those same people talk about this is out of hand. Don't tell me this is out of okay, hand. Yeah, when y'all yeah. good yeah. about? No, I agree people. with that. Like, be consistent. I agree with that. You know that. what I'm saying? Like, that's not you, but the yeah. other people. And I just yeah, think yeah. that's problematic. However, fair discussion. Good time with Man City. Um, this is probably the most. We're not going to talk a little baseball before we get started with the regular sure. season. But watching how this unfolds this season. Is going to be absolutely fascinating. Yo, but if I'm if I'm Mike Trout, if I'm Marcus Simeon, if I hit a home run against the Houston Astros, I'm flipping my bat. I'll flip my bat anyway because I don't give it. I'm telling you, they're yeah. lucky. They're lucky I don't play in in, in baseball because I'd be oh, flipping for my sure. black bat all the time. <laughs> <Looking> flipping <laughs> my black. <laughs> No, 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 I'll be black all the time. I'm not flipping the black. Ain't no flipping of the black. Black is always on. But uh, I'll be flipping my bat all the time and letting people know. I wish somebody would throw me. I'm coming right out to the mound with the bat. I wish they would. Uh, real quick before we get on to other basketball-related stuff, uh, any Mets thoughts, early Mets thoughts this year on what they're going to do this season? Or is it too early for that? Uh... Hoping we get new ownership. <laughs> there was a report the other day that made me smile that Alex Rodriguez is interested in buying the team. Yeah, so I, I hope he can get a partner to get that to happen because I think A Rod actually would be a pretty good owner. Give me Alex Rodriguez and Nas and some person with money. Oh, that's good. I want Nas to get involved. I've been wanting Nas to do it because I feel like, yo, I mean, you should you should have some sort of ownership for a sports team, bro. Like I'll, you're doing all these other. You're invested in Lyft. You're invested in Hennessy. Invested and in so Mets, many apps. And then you can make Ain't Hard to Tell podcast the official podcast of the New York Mets, which I wouldn't have a problem being tied to. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I would yeah. like that. We still have to get Nas on the show. Nas, we gotta figure out how to make that work. Nas, make it. Nas, first of all, get, get hook up with first A-Rod, of all, drop your album. album. All right. I'm good why, with the lost tapes so too, mad? but damn, man! Yeah, remember the New York Times story? Like, Nas, yo, yeah, I know. I remember. I don't think about it because it makes me upset. I just won't sound the same. Nah, it's one more. Just one more, man. Just one more. Yeah. Just one more. Uh, yeah. So, uh, no, I don't really have too many early thoughts. But I think the Mets will be competitive, but the division is tough. They didn't really do enough to upgrade. But I I'll want them to, to trade point. for Francisco Lindor. Uh, yeah, and then I heard they turned that down because they didn't want to give up. A Med Rosario. Yeah. And two, and prospects. two prospects. Look, I'm not mad at them not wanting to give up a Med Rosario because I do think that you can play one of them at second, one of them at short. But you if that was the deal breaker, Lindor, man. that's the thing, though. I If that's the deal breaker, then no, I'm trading him with well, two see, the prospects. Well, see, the deal breaker, I think, comes down to they didn't want to pay what Lindor's contract is. And I think that's and this the problem is why they need ownership. new ownership. There we go. And that's what I'm talking about. My hope is new ownership. That's all I really have to say on that. You know we like to hook our listeners up from time to time, and we have a hookup for you today. So for the listeners of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can check out one of my favorite sports books, $40 Million Slaves, The Rise, Fall, and Redemption of the Black Athlete by William C. Roden. That's available on audible.com. 
with hundreds of thousands of other books that you can listen to today. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com backslash A-H-T-T. Again, that's audibletrial.com backslash A-H-T-T for your free audiobook. All right. Um, do we? Which NBA one do you want to do first? You know what you want to bring first to my attention. You know where you want to go. You know what you want to do. You already know what you want to do because you want to. You want to. Well, we're not going to spend as much time with this because I do want to look forward to the rest of the NBA season. But I just briefly <laughs> want your thoughts on whatever Steve Stout did on first take involving the New York Knicks. Steve Stout, um, a legend in the music industry. Track masters. Trackmasters, uh, Def Jam, done a whole bunch. You know what's funny? I, I didn't watch uh, everything that he did on first take. I did read a little bit um, about it. Um, and I know that he pretty much said, like, you know, Mike Miller uh, wouldn't be back. Um, he gave up a lot of information around the Knicks that he probably wasn't supposed to do yet. And so they also talked about um, Leon Rose coming on in, in that kind of way that he probably was not supposed to talk about yet because that's not official by the Knicks, even though everybody I hear says it's a done deal. Um, here's my thing about Steve Stout. Steve Stout's talking about – I said Def Jam. I meant to say Geffen. Geffen. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Steve Stout talks it's about – the same shit, Steve Stout has been talking about <laughs> rebranding the Knicks. I think talking about rebranding the Knicks as if they're a logo – or a <laughs> podcast or something is kind of ridiculous. You know how do you you know how you know what the Knicks need to do? Get a point guard. <laughs> no, not even that. First, they got to show some competency. Then you have to. Oh, hey, here's a novel idea. Win. Yeah, that's how you rebrand. You know, what people liked in the '90s about the Knicks. <laughs> they were winning. They were competing for championships every year. Don't give me some rebrand. But that's like, what I always say in our group on. chats. I'm like, the the way for the Knicks to really turn themselves around, it's not that it's not hard to be competent, but all you have to do is just show progress. And the way you show progress as an organization is by just being quiet, really, and winning. That's really it. Just don't do a lot of dumb shit. Just don't put – just don't – just. Don't be the Astros. Just don't. Just don't. Yeah, look. Just be. Just win. Just look, win games. At the end of the day, that's all it comes out. There's out. a lot of stuff surrounding the Knicks. Obviously, uh, fired Steve Mills a couple days before the trade deadline. Uh, Scott Perry, we talked about some last, last podcast, made a good trade, got a first-round pick. Supposedly, Leon Rose is coming in. Supposedly, talk- Rich Cho is now involved. World Wide West was involved. Uh, now he's not. I don't know what's going on. We talk, I we even talked about this because when that news came out about uh, Leon Rose and people a lot of people came and asking me hey do you think this is a good move I don't know it seems reactionary to me as the Knicks seems like the Knicks are trying to follow a model that they saw the Lakers do with Rob Palenka they saw the Warriors do with Bob Myers except those dudes well Bob Myers had an apprenticeship he was studying for a year before he was elevated up to the position to bring I'm not saying Leon Rose can't do the job I'm not saying know. he can't be a good president he probably can from all you hear he knows basketball he's obviously very well connected very plugged in I don't I think the Knicks are always chasing stars I think they're not always looking at development there is more to being running a basketball operations and just having relationships with players and bringing them in one of the reasons Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving went to go play in Brooklyn is not just because Rich Kleiman had relationships with Sean Marks or whatever what happened is they saw the culture that was winning and the player development there and the young talent that they have if the Knicks do that I think they will attract stars so I hope that Leon Rose is going to be able to have, if he's coming in, to have good people around him and a good staff because that's not what I know. I think what gets l- overlooked when you do things that are short-sighted like the Knicks might be doing here, and it does seem like a rush process because Steve Mills was fired and two days later, you three days later, excuse me, you hear about Leon Rose. Why haven't you taken time and looked at other places? Have you really tried to get Masai Ujiri? Have you looked at Masai Ujiri's GM? Have you looked at the person who's second in command in... San Antonio or Utah, places where they've shown good things around player development and making good trades. It doesn't seem to me like the Knicks are being thorough here. It seems like another rush move. I hope it works out. I don't think it's a horrible move. I can't say that. It does seem like it might be a little bit rushed. And if you think you're just going to get Rob Palenka, be like, well, hey, Rob Palenka got AD and LeBron. There's a lot of factors there. LeBron went to L.A. heavily because of magic. And also he wanted to be there. AD 
was always known he wanted to go to L.A. Did Rob Plinker really do a lot of heavy lifting in getting those guys there, or did he just make the trade that needed to be made that needed to happen? I don't think it's necessarily that. I don't know what Leon Rose's credentials are in building culture. What kind of basketball does Leon Rose want to play? If I was at a press conference, I'd have all these questions. How do you plan to instill this culture? What kind of players are you looking to draft? We know none of this. And it seems to me the other problem is here is – I'm sorry for being so long-winded on this. because Nah, keep going. The Knicks keep hiring guys who have no experience doing the job. <laughs> this happened again. Steve Mills, no experience doing the job. Phil Jackson, no experience doing the job. Leon Rose, no experience doing the job. How are you still doing this? <laughs> How are they still doing that? You're so fed up. It's like, it's great. It's. It, I'm not <laughs> saying it's 100% bad, but I say you keep doing the same thing over and over again. That is the definition of insanity. Yeah. And you're not, I don't think you're being thorough. It's like, yo. That's my little concern here. You're not being thorough. At some point, if you're trying to punch someone in the head and they keep moving out the way, you have to go downstairs and go to the body. You just have okay. to change. You just have to change the way you're doing this. Yeah. And I think like, yes, nice thinking outside the box. You might want to go get yourself a... Guy who's got the agent ties, I understand and, that. And look, the Knicks could afford to throw all their money at a Masai Ujiri type of guy. Andrew, if the Knicks went out and did that, I'd be fine. There's a guy we know who knows culture. I just don't basketball. know if they'll. I don't know. I just don't know if they're like like. You'll have to give up what two first round picks or something like that. Like, would you really be willing to do that, or will it be worth it on the back end because you're getting a guy who is known for finding Fred Van Vliet's who are undrafted or and go developing? Go get them. somebody from that culture. One of the good cultures I mentioned that we've seen around the NBA, where we've seen that. Get the yeah. understudy. Get the guy who's a GM. Bring him in. Give him the opportunity. Trajan Langdon got the opportunity with Look, the Pelicans, right? After you, three years, three yeah, three and years. Now with he's the Nets. A, he's assistant GM, and now he's a GM there, and he's he's you know there. Go 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 that route. Look at what Sean Marks has been able to do when you bring in a guy from a certain culture and bring him in and he's able to implement his culture in a new place. There are other ways to do this. You don't have to just chase the big name, the sexy name, the agent, what looks trendy. I think I'd be less bothered if I knew the Knicks were more thorough in their search of doing this and actually took time. Three days after you fired Steve Mills, doesn't look like you're that thorough. Doesn't look like you're being that diverse in your search as well, too. And I mean that in terms of looking across people across the board. We'd criticize people in other industries for not doing this. We've seen it where people just get hired because of who they know. Some of that seems to be going on here. I don't think that's cool at all. So I, I'm, am I concerned? Not really. Not super concerned. I just don't know enough. Like, I don't know enough about the planners and then Dolan coming out with his little statement. Talking about he's not selling the team. It shows he's sensitive about people selling the team. The Knicks... They got a lot to show. The first thing is they need to show competence. That's well, it. The main thing is, yes, that. But in order to get players, in order to do these things that you want to do as an organization, you just have to win first. It just starts with winning. It starts and ends there. It's the reason the Clippers got Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. They were able to show how attractive they were by trading Tobias Harris and yet still, in spite of that, who was mm -hmm. their best player and leading scorer at the time, making it to the playoffs. Making it to the playoffs, giving Golden State a series, yes, it helps being in Los Angeles, and that's where Paul George grew up, that's where Kawhi Leonard grew up, but look, you're in New York. You're in a huge market. You know what I mean? The so if, market. if you, like, as early as this season, if they can down the stretch to show competence, if you can get within a couple of games of that eight seed, win 30-whatever so games, and then show teams like, yo, they're actually playing for something. Then next year, you progress again, another level, creep into that eight seed perhaps, win about 40 games, 38 games, however many games it takes to get to the eight seed. Then you're positioning yourselves to actually have a successful 2021 free agency where you're probably getting a guy or two to come play with R.J. Barrett, Mitchell Robinson, and if you still have Julius Randle at that time. The key is, does the owner and the organization have the patience to, to do that, the Knicks do are in a pretty good position. They have seven first round picks over the next four years. Um, we'll, we'll see. They I think have, they do. They, they just they have, they, to have the patience. I, I think they do. I mean, they tried to do it this this time uh, last year. They tried to do it last year. It just didn't work because I think the Nets making the playoffs and showing their competence. Like it's just yeah, it's just and it's less noisy around the Nets than it is around the Knicks. But the Knicks, you just you usually just don't. 
become a 17 win team and then all of a sudden you get the big guy in free agency that's only happened with like lebron wanting to go back to cleveland and lebron wanting to like lebron's an outlier he wanted to go to la he wanted to go to cleveland like you can get guys to come to new york you just have to win first yeah i I, I don't think somebody being an agent is going to sway i think the big free agent superstars from coming to new york most of these guys they know exactly where they want to live where they want to play what kind of culture they're going to be and i think that's the biggest thing if you show the culture is there That'll get the guys to come. Nobody's yeah. going to come and say, hey, I want to play in New York like, because Leon Rose used to be my agent and have ties with this. I don't people, think that's how it works. And people talking about wanting to get the garden rocking again. Like, that's the thing that. that well, I want the garden to be rocking about. again. I do want the garden to be rocking again. Yeah, and, 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 and the, the, that's what I'm saying is like, in order to. If, if, if people from the outside will see that, right? Even if the Knicks are 32 and 50. But R.J. Barrett looks like he's developing. Oh, people, Mitchell Robinson yeah. is actually freed up and playing often and looks like, oh, this guy can average, I don't know, 14, 11, and three blocks or something like that. All-star-ish numbers and becomes the player that he seems like he can be. If R.J. Barrett becomes an 18 to 20 point per game scorer next season and is a little more efficient and you're actually seeing the player development, because that's the most important thing here is player development, then that's going to spark everything else because – a big part of why Kevin Durant and, and Kyrie Irving went to the Brooklyn Nets was because Karis LeVert looked like he was developing. D'Angelo Russell, although he left, looked like he was developing, and he has. And he's taking another step this people season. People have developed. Joe Harris, Spencer Dinwiddie. Yeah. You know, that's what matters, but we'll see. I don't know if Leon Rose has the, the ability to do it, but I know people who come from a certain culture, they may know how to already do it, and they could yeah. bring that here, and maybe that's what the Knicks are I don't think, like I don't think it's a bad move at all. I, I just, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I think it's a little bit of a reactionary move, and it could, could be short-sighted, but we will see. Speaking of the NBA. Yes. Predictions the rest of the way. Now. Are you, you going to predict the Knicks are going to make the playoffs? <laughs> do it. Because I won't. Well, I'm gonna look at the standings, and I'm not gonna say that I'm not gonna say that they're gonna. What, did you, what did you do to me uh, about a week ago? You texted me and told me, "Oh, the Knicks are five games." Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and I'm like totally, I'm totally making up your voice there. I said what they want said? four. I said, they, I said they want. They, I probably said something along the lines of, "Oh, they're they're only five games out after this winning streak." Eyeball emoji, eyeball emoji. And I, and I looked at my phone and I rolled my eyes and I was like, "Wake me up when they're two games out." They're seven really games excited. out right now. Yeah, look how quickly that changed in a week. They're 17 and 38. Before the season began, I did have them winning 30 games. That's still a feasible. I had them number. winning 28. That's still a feasible number. I think. Still a feasible number. Although they would need to be 13 and 14 the rest of the way. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I think it's more like they'll hit 28 or 27, 28. Yeah. Likely. Which, look, 11 games worth of progress. That's what I thought they'd be. Take do, that though. for what that's worth. That's what I thought they'd be. Um, Right now. Unless we're not we're not predicting the Knicks to make the playoffs, so we can move on from there. Yes, but thank God. But but I'm looking at Washington, who is three games behind Orlando, who is five games behind the Nets. I don't know if they have enough aside from Bradley Beal, but I think that Bradley Beal is on a mission because he is pissed off about not being an All Star despite scoring almost thirty points a game. And I think I think. Like, he's the best player out of everyone that's on the Nets right now, out of everyone that's on the Magic right now, out of everyone that's obviously on the Wizards, the Bulls. Like, everyone that has a player from seven on the way down in the Eastern Conference, Bradley Beal, is the best player in that whole group. Is he enough to lead him to the playoffs? Uh, I could see it because Orlando's been so bad lately. Um, I could see it. I think they'll be right there until the end between them and Orlando. You would see. You would like to think that Kyrie Irving's health sort of impacts this because oh, he comes back healthy, and then the Nets will be on a run. Where it hasn't quite worked out that way. They kind of played a lot of his best basketball without him. I think the Nets will be fine. I think that's going to make it. It's Orlando. I'd worry about. Yeah. Um, that I mean, I, th- could I catch. think the Nets are going to make it, but the second half of their schedule is not I, necessarily. I don't think there's anybody else in the either. East that's going to give Washington problems to ru- make a run at Orlando. Maybe Charlotte, but uh, that Detroit, no. Um, Look at the Nets schedule as soon as they come back from the All Star break. It's not great because I was looking at this the other day and I was like, "Oh, this could this could actually go south." the The next hmm, seven games, six of them are on the road. The only one at home is against Orlando. The ones on the mm-hmm. road include Philly, Charlotte, Washington, Atlanta, Miami, and Boston. Those winnable games in there. Mm, 
Mm. Charlotte, Washington's winnable. Charlotte, look Atlanta. at Charlotte, at Washington, at a winnable. Got to win those winnable, games. but if you're the other team, I'm like Psh, the Nets are coming here. That's a winnable game for us. The Nets have to win those games though. Ah, right, okay. They're not. They're not guaranteed wins, but they're winnable. They should. They in that in that seven game stretch, if they go two and five, am I going to be shocked? No, I'm not. I'm not. They should. Most of them are on the road. I, I think, They're not a great road team. I don't, I don't think they can. I, this is what I'll say. They, they can't be worse than three and four. They're nine to 16 on the road this season. You but know what I'm saying? Like They can't go worse than three and four in that stretch. Then after that, home Memphis, home Spurs, home Bulls. But then you have at Lakers, Warriors, Clippers, When Kings. is Kyrie scheduled to come back? Don't know. Does it matter? Yes. He's not that much of a plus. It's a plus, though. It's a plus that solidifies the plus. I mean, like, he's super talented, but, like, yo, he, teams that, again, teams that have lost him haven't necessarily gotten worse. Some of the players got better, like Jason Tatum. Yeah, Jason Tatum's an all-star. Jalen Brown probably should have been an all-star. And Boston's happier now. Um, predictions for last leg of the NBA season. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Like, I'm just saying, like. I think. Then the, they have, they I, have, there's a road here, game with Milwaukee down here, the stretch. Here's a prediction for me. I think the Miami Heat. Lock up the number two seed. In. Oh, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I like the Miami Heat like they were doing. I Culture. Think, I, think they're, I think they're adjusting these veteran pieces like Iguodala and Jay Crowder in, and I think they're going to get tougher and mentally ready. I also am going to go out and put another bold prediction. The Philadelphia 76ers will not have home court advantage in the first round. I agree with both of those. I think – I agree more so with Philly because I actually think that Boston might take that second seat. I don't I don't think Toronto is going to stay up there necessarily. If I can go through Toronto's schedule real quick. Because by comparison, of those sort of upper echelon teams in the Eastern Conference, what I've looked at, Miami has a easier schedule than those other teams. And that matters because they've been so good at home this season, as you know. The Miami Heat. As you know. Yeah. <laughs> the Miami Heat so far home this season are 22 and 3. The second, the third best record in the Eastern Conference of all the teams at home. Philly is 25 and 2 at home and 9 and 19 on the road. The Nets are actually a better road team than the Sixers, which is amazing. Um, the Bucks 25 and 3 at home. And then the Heat 22 and 3. And the Celtics are 23 and 5, so they're in that class too. The Raptors are actually a really good road team, which is interesting. Now, if you look at Toronto's schedule. Phoenix at home. They have four straight home games right off the bat. Phoenix, Indiana, Milwaukee, Charlotte. They'll go three and one, two and two, something like that. Should. Um, at Denver, hmm. At Phoenix, hmm. Phoenix is not great, but that's they can win a home game against Toronto. Mm -hmm. At Golden State, I mean, they lost to the Nets at home. I mean, they lost to the Nets on the road. I mean, at the Kings, at Utah, then Detroit, Golden State, but then you're at Philly. They have a road Knicks game at some point, which they should win. And they have Memphis, which I don't know if they're going to win. They have Milwaukee on the road. They have Houston on the road. Their last two games, this is interesting. So Toronto, their very last two games of the season, at Miami, at Orlando, both in Florida. That Miami one could be very interesting because they could be jockeying for position at that point. Yeah, it'll be interesting to And see. some of their home games, they have Boston, Denver, Milwaukee again. They played Milwaukee see, three times. Was, the, Toronto plays Milwaukee three times the rest of the season. That's that, crazy. That's it. But they play tough every night. Oh, no, I agree, but and what I'm saying give is... Nurse a lot of credit, But what man. I'm saying is that winning streak was huge because if it wasn't for that, I wasn't sure that they were going to get home field home court advantage. I feel good that they're going to get home court advantage the first series. I just still think that they're probably going to drop to two or three. Right now, they're 40 and 15. They're six and a half games out of uh, Milwaukee. I think Milwaukee's going to stay first. No, and, they're not catching Milwaukee. Yeah, but... Miami is four and a half games behind them. I think they can make up that deficit. There's enough time for that. Boston, I think, is the team that I'm really looking at to get that second seed. I Boston is that. two games, uh, one and a half games behind. I don't know if they're going to get a big in the buyout market, but I would like to see that. I would like to see them get Tristan Thompson, but he's not getting bought out. Tristan Thompson, I think, is that piece. Out. Yeah, I do. Let's we'll see if his mind changes on that. That whole situation. Cleveland is just not. I don't know what they're doing. All right, any predictions for you in the Western Conference? Wait, real quick, Miami schedule. Because, uh, look, at Atlanta, Cleveland, Cleveland, home and home. Home against Minnesota, Dallas, Boston, Milwaukee, Orlando. At New Orleans, at Washington. Home against Charlotte, home against the Knicks, home against the Bulls. Very favorable. Stop right there. Stop right That's there. Very favorable. Because you're looking at between now and March 14th, that is a 13-game stretch where they can easily win 10 of those games. You go ten and well, three. Well, that could be huge in them making up that ground. Right, that's what I'm team. saying. You go ten and three, eleven and two, even. 
during that stretch, and you're you're going to be two or three in the Eastern Conference. You're probably going to be three. You're going to be up there, and then you just have to make up ground the rest of the way. After that, it gets a little trickier because you're at Milwaukee, which they've won at already without Jimmy Butler, at Chicago, yep. at Indiana, home against uh, Oklahoma City, Denver, Phoenix. Then you're at Charlotte, at Boston, at Detroit at the Knicks, and then down the stretch is not so bad. Indiana at home, Detroit at home, Boston at home, mm-hmm. at Charlotte. Their last game of the season is actually home against Toronto. So that's interesting because they play home against Toronto the very last game of the season. Toronto has one more game after that before the playoffs. That's, that's interesting. It all be, will depend a lot on where they are. Okay, that'll be interesting to see. Um, I, in the Western Conference, I don't know if I have anything big, but I do think the race for like the final playoff spot is going to be interesting. I think it really comes down to well, do you think Portland's going to make it? Or do you think Memphis, who's played good and beat Portland recently before the All-Star break in a very entertaining game, is going to make it? Portland's, Portland's schedule, four games out right now. I know. Now. That's four games out of Four games out of eight. Eight games back of seven. Um, mm-hmm. OKC has been really good, and they look like they're going to make it. I think it's going to get tight. I think Memphis is going to... It's going to get a little tight for them because they haven't been here before. So I do think Portland's not going to fall out of this. Also, keep your eye on New Orleans. They have a very easy schedule going down the stretch. I'm going to say Portland finds a way to get it done. I, I, I agree. Eight. I agree. I think Memphis falls out. The games get a little become a little too big for them. Yeah, I agree. I think Dame is going to somehow will the team in their way into there. Um, now, that probably means they meet the Lakers in the first round. Um, I'm sure the Lakers would probably rather see the Grizzlies than Portland. Um, not that I think Portland would win, but they're going to be. They're gonna they can them, push them to they're six. Gonna push them. They're going to give them. Yeah, they're going to give them some trouble. Portland, uh, Detroit. Uh, they have New Orleans, Detroit, Boston at home. Right off the bat, okay. Right after got to go three and one. Right after the well, yeah. and, and at Indiana. So yes, they got to go three and one through those four games. At Atlanta, at Orlando, Washington at home, at Phoenix, and then they have one, two, three, six straight home games. That's gonna be at a, one point. Kings, big, Suns, Grizzlies, Rockets, Timberwolves, Mavericks. That's a big stretch. That's for a them. huge stretch because after that you have six straight road games. Who the hell made this schedule? They have six straight they games must at have home. Something in town. Yeah, six straight games at home and six straight on the road. The ones on the road: Minnesota, Charlotte, Detroit, Boston, Philly, Brooklyn, and then they come back and have four straight at home again. Uh, another long home streak that is. Utah, Memphis, Cleveland, well, look, Denver. Look, every, every game for them for now is a playoff game, so they're going to be a very intriguing team to watch out. The Last game of the almost. season is home against the Clippers. That's a big one. Well, it depends what who's playing for what. That all depends on that. Now the, you said Memphis real quick. Memphis, uh, you said the games might get too big for them. They're going to find out right off the bat because this is the hardest probably. Yeah, I'm really intrigued to see how they do. Their first four games after the All Star break at Sacramento, at Lakers, at Clippers, at Rockets. The yeah. at Sacramento and at Lakers is a back to back, so they get the the Lakers the second night of a back to back, then yeah, at Clippers tough. at Rockets, then home against the Kings, home against the Lakers, and then they come to the East Coast at Atlanta at Boston at the, at Dallas, and then they have some other games. They have Utah down the stretch. It's the Western Conference, so they're gonna have they they're have gonna a, have a lot of tough games. Big yeah. home and home with New Orleans. That's a big one. And then toward the end of the season, these are their last six games. You have Dallas at home, at Portland, at Denver, home against Oklahoma City, home against Philly, at Houston. That's huge. I think Memphis gets knocked out. I'm also going to make another prediction here. Oh, I have. I, let me give you one of mine real quick. Yeah. Let me give you one of mine real quick. I think Oklahoma City is going to fall, and I think, uh, I mean, no, I think fall. Houston's going to fall, and I think Oklahoma City is going to pass them. See, I'm going to go my prediction the opposite of you. I actually am starting to watch. Houston's going to go up? No, I don't know if they're going to go up. I'm not going to go that high. But I think Houston's small ball is going to work well against some other teams. And I kind of like certain things I see out of it. I still don't think they have enough players to defend. But I'll tell you what. Westbrook's playing some efficient basketball. I like how he's playing right now. He's attacking the rim. You said it last time. He spoke. He's virtually being the center on the yeah, team. he's like the center now. Now, I'm intri- what I'm intrigued in watching is what teams will still keep their center out there. We saw Utah do this with Rudy Gobert and still keep him out there and guard him. Not every team has him. The Lakers have the bigs who could defend what teams do. it, But I think it's actually going to work well for Houston down the stretch of the season. Maybe you'll get them the four seed. I they could see him moving up, but not a lot. I just think enough that it's going to be like you're going to look at them tonight and say they're going to give teams problems. The question is, Brian, the question is, the big money question isn't about the season. It's about can this be done in the playoffs? Do you believe it'll work in the playoffs? I'm not so sure, but it does give me this intriguing thing to watch them. I've been enjoying watching their games with the small ball lineup just to see 
how other teams are reacting to it. So it's, I'm almost watching these Houston games differently now. You think OKC okay, so is going to pass them. I think that's fascinating. I could see that happening. Um, I'll tell you who be smiling about that. Chris Paul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, y'all trading me. I want to pass y'all. Yeah, and and we get. I, I think I think there's a scenario. I'm, I don't know if I predict this, but the Clippers I think could fall to four. I think Utah could pass them. I don't think the Clippers care about where they're seated. And I don't think it necessarily matters. But, but I do because I don't want a Lakers Clippers second round. Yeah, I don't want. I that. want a conference finals. finals. Yeah, so I don't true. want it to be one and four. That's true. We don't want that. You know what I mean? So, I, but I feel comfortable saying that the Lakers will win the the Western Conference. I think they will. At the regular season. Yeah, I think they will too. I think they could win the playoffs too. But um, after what Dev, watching there's a lot of teams. What how Denver plays down the stretch? How Utah plays down the stretch? That like two two through six is going to be very interesting. I actually think it's important who comes up with the second seed. Yeah. If I had to put my money on a team right now, I'm going to put it on Denver. If I had to put the money on it right now, I think if the Clippers really put their the pedal to the metal and they actually care, they could get it. But I don't think that they do. So it's gonna it's it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. So the last bit of NBA season should be uh, very interesting. We'll see how it goes uh, with more in the NBA season. One time for your mind, one time. One time for your mind, one time. All right, one time for your mind. One time for your mind. Before we get out of here, what you got this week, Brian? We usually try to veer off from sports, but I'm going with sports here. But I'm going to tie it into. I'm going to tie it into. I'm going to tie it into something uh, societal. This is a societal issue. It's people like Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill is somebody (laughs) who. (laughs) I thought you were the president of Taysom Hill fan. (laughs) Taysom Hill. Who is 29 years old. He's going to be 30 in August. Yep. People seem to think that he could be a franchise quarterback. He wants to be a franchise quarterback. I don't care that he wants to be a franchise quarterback. Um, But, like, can we be honest? He sucks. Just in terms of, like, as a passer, like as a quarterback. If you've seen him at BYU and <laughs> – his injury history is another thing that sort of factors into this, but I'll get to that in a second. But if you've seen him at BYU, just numbers alone, right? So he played five seasons. He was a starter, you know, majority of that time. Uh, his completion percentage, career, 58. 43 touchdowns, 31 picks. His very last season where you're supposed to go out with a bang, played 12 games, completed about 60% of his passes, 12 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. He was essentially a gadget player who could throw because he was running the ball all the time, sort of like what he was doing with the Saints, except mm-hmm. they have, oh, I don't know, Drew Brees, <laughs> and then they have a much better quarterback and Teddy Bridgewater he ahead of him. talked about, and you, yeah. want, and you have to wonder why that is. Teddy Bridgewater um, is supposed to be like an inspirational story because he almost lost his leg, came back in the NFL, and except is actually a really good player. people seem to be more player. inspired by Taysom Hill. They were 5-0. and oh. Yeah, so this, this is kind of what I'm getting at, is that this is a larger issue, right? Then it's not just an NFL thing, but it's like, yo, certain people – just think that they can sort of be mediocre and get from point A to point B. And I think that Taysom Hill sort of exemplifies this because these people have done this historically, and that's part of the issue as well. Can we we talk about about people who have looked like Taysom, not looked like Taysom Hill, but have played the game like Taysom Hill and actually threw better than Taysom Hill but didn't get the same opportunity? Brad Smith is rolling over. Brad Smith is rolling over in his grave right now. Well, he's not dead. He's (laughs) He's not dead. No, I know, but it's an expression. Uh, For people who are dead. (laughs) Brad Smith, this is what pissed me off. In my days as a Jet fan, I remember Brad Smith. I was like, yo, dad, because I asked him one time, I was like, yo, dad, this guy that we just drafted, like, how come they're saying he can't play quarterback? All of his highlights were him as a quarterback. Because he's black. <laughs> That's not what he told me. But but your dad knew what was up. Yeah. He knew what it was. But he, but he, he said, like, oh, they have a quarterback now, so I don't know why they drafted him. So then we later figured out, oh, he wasn't drafted to play quarterback. It's like, oh, he can be a receiver. So I went up and pulled up some Brad Smith numbers, right? Brad Smith, who as a college quarterback didn't have a high completion percentage either, but his touchdown to interception ratio was way better historically than mm-hmm. Taysom Hills. He also didn't end four of his five seasons with career, no, with season-ending injuries because Taysom Hill got hurt yep. four different times Yep. Injury history. So if people want to, if people want to know why he's 29 and saying that he thinks he could be a franchise quarterback, it's because he had to go through a bunch of shit to even get to this point. And Teddy Bridgewater, who doesn't have as much of an injury history, almost lost his leg. Is two years younger than Taysom Hill, and is undefeated as a starter. And is the same dude that Sean Payton said 
yo, uh, we don't need to go get another quarterback. We have a we have a guy right here. We have Teddy Bridgewater for when Drew Brees retires, if and when that happens, if that happens this season, right? Taysom Hill is not a pro quarterback, but it's again, it's people that think they could just skate by. You know what I mean? Because they're they're white mediocrity has been rewarded consistently throughout history. It still gets done in all kinds of industries. And it allows people, bro. We work in media. It allows people to do that. What we, happens is we're surrounded by. I it. was just reading this. Uh, <laughs> Howard Bryant had a great chapter on, in his book, Full Dissident, about this, in which white people generally are hiring and choosing people in these places because they're used to seeing their parents in power, and then their parents and the older people hire. They end up hiring people that look like them. So the looking the part of a quarterback has always been white. And so, but remember, looking the part of a quarterback has always been white, stand in the pocket and throw it, not athletic and running it around. And when the black guys were athletic and running around uh, at the quarterback position, the game told them, we don't want that. You have to go play somebody else. Now the white dude is doing it here, even though he's been injured and he doesn't have a good completion percentage. Now y'all want that? When is looking- Because you think he's going to be closer to Lamar Jackson and the large Mahomes? And the larger issue of why I brought this into this segment is looking the part has always been a white thing. That's never been meant for us. Yeah. Why? Why, though? Yeah, man. Now when it looks apart, now now it's that you say, "Oh, these athletic quarterbacks." I don't think Taysom Hill like should be Lamar able to Jackson. get away with this. What do you mean, it, Taysom like, Hill's going to get away with this because society is pushing for? Well, the I this. I want to see. Ultimately, I don't think he's going to get a shot in terms of like as a starting quarterback. But I wouldn't be surprised if he did. I'd actually be disappointed if he did because he's he sucks as a as a pocket passer. Taysom Hill. Like more people will talk. He's about not Lamar Jackson. Lamar, Lamar Jackson could actually throw yeah. well. Yeah, but they tried to deny that of Lamar Jackson until people have seen it work to some degree towards the NFL MVP, and now it's okay for the white guy to be that. That's right, my point right, of what right. I'm saying. Right, and that's, and that's the thing. It's like uh, That's my point of what I'm saying. Meanwhile, you got a guy out in L.A., a black dude who's a backup to Phillip Rivers, Tyrod Taylor, who actually had some good seasons for the Bills, but nobody ever gives enough credit. Not great. He was a pro bowler. Pro- I think he, he was a pro bowler. He was an adequate quarterback. We'll, let's see if he gets a shot. But they wanted to give Josh Allen a shot. Why? Because Josh Allen is tall and he has an arm and he looks the part. And apparently looks, he's athletic too. Looks the part. But I bet you with Tyrod Taylor, that team probably would have won a playoff. Let me game. tell you something. The new thing you're going to see in the NFL is a lot of people rooting for these somewhat athletic white guys right. to start showing they can Right, win. right, yep. exactly. That's it's going to be a whole bunch of white scrambling quarterbacks all over the place. Now it's cool. And then Lamar Jackson and dudes like that are going to be like, oh, we can't do this now? We were trying to do this before, and, now you're, and y'all are looking at us funny? Yep. And what, is, and, and what does this say also about the black pocket passers who actually looked the part? The guys who were get, who the guys like Teddy Bridgewater, they ain't gonna like, like Geno no Smith, who was also yeah, from Miami. Y'all, y'all told us this is what we had to be. We ended up trying to be pocket passers, and now you're saying that we don't want. Remember to what? Win. Remember what I remember what I brought up on a on an episode not that long ago, where Geno Smith was drafted to be a quarterback of the New York Jets, and what did they do? They put him in the Wildcat. They had him running the option. Yep. He was running an air raid system at West Virginia. He's a pocket passer. He didn't run the football. He looked like he should have been in the Wildcat option, no. and, and and Taysom Hill looks like he should have an opportunity. And this is not and this is not limited to football. This is just societal, societal issue. problems. All right. societal issue. My one time for your mind. Uh, I'm going to the world of music. Uh, just going to kind of give a recommendation of some something I listen to in the world of hip hop. Uh, haven't really spoken about this on the podcast, but uh, if anybody got a chance to watch the Netflix uh, comp- hip hop competition series, Rhythm and Flow. Uh, that came out last year it was really good. I'm really not a big a competition series guy. I didn't really care for American Idol or anything like that. Really good, um, despite Cardi B being a little bit annoying sometimes on the show. It was pretty good, and I thought the rapper that they picked to win this competition was the most complete artist in, in the competition. His name is D Smoke from Englewood, California. Um, he really good. I was very impressed with his song making ability. Uh, actually did not realize that he is, his brother is Sir, the R&B singer on TDE. Um, he also is the cousin of somebody who has been on some backpack broadcasting videos that I've done, Iman Omari, who also produced on Kendrick Lamar Section 80. 80. Um, so he comes from a very talented musical family um, that, that I've known. But he uh, put out an EP shortly after the show last year. I thought it was solid, interesting. If you listen to him, you'll hear a li- you'll get a lot of Kendrick vibes. They have kind of similar cadences mm. in the way they rap. That's why, but you like uh, a very good, um, very good skilled rapper, very good song maker um, for a guy in his early early th- early thirties. But his debut uh, album uh, dropped uh, recently. It's called Black Habits. It's mm. really solid. It's good. Haven't really heard many uh, hip hop releases thus far. This year, but this is a really good project. I would have tightened it a bit if I was him, but there's some really, really good songs 
good features from Jill Scott. Snoop Dogg is on here. Um, but just some really good stuff talking about, you know, his experiences being a black man. Really excited about him as an artist and what he has to do next. I think for an artist who came into the rap game late, you can see his ability to actually make songs and, and pr- craft a good project. And you can see the musicality that he has. Um, also encourage people. He's on his press run now. Go check out his L.A. Leakers freestyle that he did rapping over Rosa Parks. He mm. absolutely kills it. Not a beat you get to hear a lot of people rap about. You got to get in the pockets that Big Boy and Andre were on in that. He absolutely kills it. He also raps in Spanish, which Ooh, okay. uh, might appeal to uh-huh. some. So he's got he's he used to teach Spanish. He's very studied in in, uh, in Spanish. So I think he has some Afro Latino roots. And um, very interesting artist. Very talented. Uh, like I said, not too many. It's very early in the year. We haven't heard too many hip hop projects, but. One of the ones I'm really enjoying so far this year. So D Smoke, Black Habits, uh, check that out one time for your mind. Always here to pass on some new information, some new music. And yeah, do what Brian said. Check out Taysom Hill's numbers and then ask yourself, <laughs> ask yourself for real, do you think Taysom Hill should be a starting quarterback? If you do, you probably also thought Tim Tebow should have been starting. And, and pay attention to the people getting opportunities in your field and in what you do. Yeah, let's try to change that. White mediocrity. That's a whole, that's, that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother thing. All right, that's it. For now, this. that doesn't mean all of them are mediocre. No, it means. But you there, know, some people is, will take it that way. There is such, whatever. They can, <laughs> they can take it that way. They can do whatever they want to do with that if they don't want to listen. That's fine. Right, uh, but white mediocrity has been rewarded in many fields, and it's not exclusive to sports. Uh, all right, that's it for this episode of the A Heart to Tell podcast, episode one hundred and ten. Uh, please be sure to follow us, support us on Patreon, support us on all our platforms. A lot of good uh, content coming out. Uh, across the next couple of weeks, got some Word. really good episodes that I think you guys will like out, like uh, including uh, some, you know, some guests we have on and some other things that we'll focus on in the next couple of weeks. So please stay tuned uh, to the Hard to Tell podcast for Brian Fonseca. I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.